I'd like to talk a little bit about Kurt Doolittle's confusion about religion and uh, more generally about the fact that the Indo-European tripartite magisteria or organizations is not really what he thinks it is, at least in my opinion. And I'd like to clarify, first of all, religion. He talks a lot about decidability in things like court, uh, science, etc. Natural science is not something where things are decidable. Mathematical science or logic is where things are decidable. In the world that we actually live in, the natural world that we live in, we experience all kinds of ambiguities. And we try to make the best sense of it we can with our limited intelligence and information, but we're imperfect in our knowledge and in our intelligence, and therefore in our ability to make decisions. But every action we take is a decision. Therefore, we are creatures of faith. Now, you can say, the sky is blue. Yeah, the sky is blue, usually. You can say the sun's going to come tomorrow. The sun's going to come up tomorrow. Probably. These are things where most rational people would agree there is a gradation of certainty. Nevertheless, as we have seen, our flexibility and beliefs being stretched to the limit by the falsehoods of what propertarians call the Abrahamic sophistry. This is an inherent aspect of our need to be able to imagine a wide variety of outcomes to our behavior and value systems. Agreed, these have been subverted by alien parasites. And this is something that's going to happen in the natural world, and we need to be aware of it and deal with it. Even when we deal with it, we're still going to be living with each other and with the potential for mutual exploitation. So there's always going to be that aspect, and we always have to fight it off as individuals, ultimately. Now, I heard Doolittle say something about one achieves sovereignty by joining a raiding party. That's true in the sense that the raiding party's very existence in the first place is to deal with group organisms that invade and violate the integrity of individuals. And so, in order to fight that off, you have to usually form groups that are able to fight that off. But the purpose, the end purpose of that, is to regain individual sovereignty among the culture of individual integrity. And this culture goes back before the Indo-European or barbarian pastoralists of the steppes. It is a root culture that has developed in humans uniquely, apparently uniquely, in what we now think of as whites or Europeans, both in the nomadic steppes and also in the Western hunter-gatherers. They are both from the same root, and they took different paths in dealing with the cultures of group integrity that were arising in the south and in the Mesopotamian areas, as well as earlier in the African culture from which they had escaped much earlier. So when I talk about religion, when I talk about our need for recognizing that we are religious creatures, 
I'm not talking about the kind of religion that Doolittle and many other people talk about when they talk about the tripartite uh, magisteria of the Indo-Europeans. I'm talking about something that's deeper than that, that goes back to the very nature of nervous systems, sense of mortar, sense of mortar decision making, where we have to take actions in the absence of complete information and in the absence of perfect intelligence. When we impose these kinds of decisions on other people through whatever means, we're taking from them their agency. And we need to be very careful about doing that. Because if we do that as a matter of, let's say, our self-interest, what we are doing is making ourselves dependent on others of our species in a way that can cause us to become group organisms and people who think that becoming group organisms is the way forward in evolution need to look back in evolutionary history to the origin of nervous systems to the transition from mitosis to meiosis and reproduction from asexual to sexual species where there was an explosion of diversity and life forms around the Cambrian time that produced the nervous systems that we have and therefore our current intelligence. These organisms, these sexual multicellular organisms, are vastly sophisticated civilizations of mutually cooperating and self-sacrificing clones of mitotic cells that join together the way we are asked by people like Kurt Doolittle to join together in a group organism, a raiding party, to be able to fight and gain our sovereignty. No, that's not the way evolution works. We saw how evolution works in this respect when individual, or say, individual organisms, mitotic cells, joined it together as clone armies that would in intrasexual male selections or intra, you know, male intrasexual selection in the very earliest of sexual organisms resulted in the appearance of a, an explosion of life forms in the fossil record. Now, in the primate line, there was a development that was very important very early on through whatever evolutionary pressures we can only surmise. There was a genetic mutation in primates, probably having to do with the visual cortex because of the fact that some of the earliest primates were very dependent upon their vision. Um, possibly nighttime predatory behavior. However it happened, the, there was a genetic mutation in primates that produced smaller neurons. In other words, it actually decoupled the size of the body in primates from the size of the neurons. Other species, for example, if you go to in a rodents or whatever, you have a larger organism and you will have larger neurons. With primates, that changed. And as a result, even though the earliest primates were very tiny, as there became a diversity of primates that had larger bodies, the number of neurons that could be contained in their nervous system dramatically increased because they were small. And when we get to the point of the common ancestor for chimpanzees and humans, this density of neurons 
allowed for there to be cognition at a level where there could be gang formation based upon agency. In other words, an individual was no longer fighting another individual male for access to females. It became possible for there to be raiding parties of these proto-hominins. And as a result, you could have male intrasexual selection going on between groups. What happened with Europeans is there was a symbiosis that was created between individual males that were ejected from their hunting groups, their Cro-Magnon hunting groups, in the northern reaches during the time that the megafauna were available for hunting groups. And those individual males who were rejected for whatever reason found themselves following around the hunting groups looking for the scraps from the megafauna kills. There's a lot of scraps. Megafauna kills are hard to completely consume. And the cro not very well adapted, as were, say, the Neanderthals, would tend to overexploit and leave a lot of waste. This waste would attract scavengers, like wolves, as well as letting there to be a lot of calories around for the rejected peripheral males. This didn't happen in places like Africa. The rejected males would be out there fighting with the wolves for the scraps. Usually, probably, they would be killed. But at some point, it is apparent that these individual peripheral males started becoming the alphas of the wolf packs that were following around the Cro-Magnon hunter groups. And these individual alpha males, in the wolf pack sense, would have become more independent and, uh, of human groups and become dependent on another species for the group organism that was hunting. So when they went from scavenging to hunting smaller game as the megafauna started disappearing, the symbiosis between the wolf pack and the alpha male human that was a beta male in the hunting group created what we now think of as Europeans or whites but was actually much more ancient and gave rise to both the Eastern, some may say the Esir, and the Western, some may call the Vanir, that had different environments in which they were evolving. The Eastern, or the Esir, began these hunting, hunting parties, these raids, this raiding culture, and the reason they did it was because of the fact that they had started hunting the horses with their wolf packs, their really early dogs. And this goes back tens of thousands of years. As they started hunting these horses with their dogs, or their proto-dogs, they found that they were able to domesticate the horses, and this created a culture that we now associate with the barbarian pastoralists. It's a different culture than the Western uh, culture. The Western culture retained a lot of the hunter-gatherer behaviors that had been at the root of both cultures, in which the individual male heads of hunting packs would come into conflict with each other, and this occurred throughout Eurasia. They would come into conflict with each other over hunting territory, just as would hunting groups in Africa 
and most likely Cro-Magnon come into conflict with each other and engage in war. The difference, the thing that makes us what we are and who we are is the fact that the individual man, even though accompanied by his wolf pack, would be fighting another individual man with his wolf pack in the state of nature over hunting territory. This individual versus individual conflict over essentials of life reawakened the male intrasexual selection regime that had created nervous systems going back to the Cambrian explosion. This is a big deal. Individual integrity is a big deal. The ability of an individual man to relate to nature without intermediation of other people and therefore without the manipulation of his perception and ultimately of his behavior and values by other people is a big deal. This is what makes us who we are. The barbarian pastoralists began to interact with the agrarian cultures of the South, the more civilized group-oriented cultures of the South, and when they did, they saw a degeneration and produced a cultural reaction to that of raiding, which was essentially a contempt for the kind of man, if you will, that would gang up with other men on an individual man to be able to gain access to females. This is a violation. It's an old violation going back six million years, but nevertheless, it's a violation of a much deeper reality of sexual being that created our nervous systems. And this contempt is what permitted these raiding cultures to develop the, uh, the market for individual warriors. These individual warriors could go between the raiding parties. This market, where you have a hunting party, if you will, a raiding party, a leader of such a raiding party would have to basically sell his raiding party to the individuals, and those individuals could leave and go join other raiding parties. But they all shared this contempt for the group organisms that they were exploiting. And yeah, there was mutual exploitation that would take place, but nevertheless, the real point of this culture was to retain enough of the individual choice, an individual agency, an individual sovereignty of going between raiding parties that it could become actually confused in the minds of people like Kurt Doolittle for being essential to individual integrity and sovereignty. The West was different. In the West, even into the last couple thousand years, the idea of kings, permanent leaders of warrior parties, was not really in effect. It was actually noted that these kings of the West would be temporary positions and there would not be ongoing war parties. People individually would come together and they would form war parties when they needed to, but then they would disband. And this is the fundamental clash between the West and the East. It's not a deep clash and it's why there was eventually a truce between the Esir and the Veneer even though there was a war. We today need to understand that our women 
were evolved to expect this deep sexuality going back 600 million years, if not more. And that their reaction to civilization, unconscious as it is, is essentially saying, tear it down. Every shit test that a young woman puts a male through is essentially saying to him, look at the civilization that stands behind me, ready, willing, and able, and eager to throw you into a prison where you will become a sex slave to an ethnic gang from a group-oriented culture. Why don't you tear it down? That's what she's saying in her deepest being to that young man when she's giving him a shit test. Now, there are guys like Hartis that are around giving ways of young men to deal with this without tearing civilization down, at least not immediately. But we have to understand that this is what women are saying to us. They're saying to us to tear civilization down because they want to get back to the natural regime of sexual selection. At another level, of course, they're saying, we want the gracious things of civilization because like all of us, we're addicted. We're addicted to, to the gracious things of civilization. Now, I'm not gonna say, let's all just go back to resolving all of our disputes. Ultimately, I shouldn't say all, but having the appeal of last resort and dispute processing, being two men going out and simulating to hunters in charge of their wolf packs, encountering each other in nature to maintain our sexual selection direction. But I will say this, when we depart from that environment where an individual is the locus of agency and the locus of selection, locus of sovereignty, and we go into these war parties, there is a natural division into three parts that can be corresponded to the tripartite brain, having to do with different levels of consciousness. In the religious aspect of that tripartite society, it is essential that the individuals who are participating at that level are priests or whatever you want to call them. It's essential that those priests be in touch with this deeper aspect of individual integrity. And in fact, you will see that in some of the stories of the ancient Brahmins that would live in what we might think of as a kind of a state of nature, close to nature. So we need to have that aspect and we need to maintain that aspect with consciousness that our natural state and our, if you will, golden age has more to do with being able to rid ourselves of the hunting packs and of the raiding parties. But we can only do so if we rid our environment of group organisms that go clear back to the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees, which itself is a regression to the pre-sexual mode of evolution where organisms would be forming groups to fight other groups of organisms, eventually giving rise to sexuality itself, where we are in male intersexual selection as individuals engaging in a civilization versus civilization conflict, mano a mano, where each civilization consists of a highly cohesive army of clone warriors themselves, individuals, not individuals.